And we are going to continue to look in the book of Judges, chapter 6 today. We spent three weeks in the Judge, Judges, chapter 5. So we welcome again those of you who are tuning in, those who may be joining us today. Uh, don't feel pressured one way or another. That's not the point of what we're going to do. We're trying to be loving. That's the key of what we're going to do. And in loving one another, we are sensitive to others who may be vulnerable, who may be at a higher risk than others, elderly, those who are immune compromised. And the fact that, you know, anyone else could be carrying something that we don't even realize, because it could be asymptomatic. In a loving way, we want to gradually uh, reopen, but we do want to uh, open for those of us who love Jesus, and that's the reason why we're here. We're not meeting here to make any political statement. I'm not here to advertise that, hey, look at us. Um, but I'm trying to just say that if you love Jesus as, as I do, and you love one another, God's people, then we will meet in a loving way. And that's what we are trying to do. So we wear our masks when necessary. We stay distant. At the same time, we love Jesus. And so that's what I want us to do today. That's what I want us to do in the coming weeks. If you have any questions about that, or if you want to question what some of the things I'm doing, feel free to talk to me about it. And I'm open to talk about it. But that's what I, I ask you to respect. What I ask people to do it for now, and I know that many of you may not like it, but I'm asking you to do that. So thank you for your for your uh, understanding on that. Today uh, we are uh, going to look in Judges, and I pray that, well, let's pray before we begin. Father, we thank you that you have allowed us to have this uh, time to again look into your word, and we pray, Father, that we uh, would. Uh, Hear your voice through your Holy Spirit that you would uh, teach us, Father, uh, because we are open to hear you. We want to hear you. And we love you, Lord Jesus. Speak to us now, Holy Spirit. Father, bless us now as we uh, uh, hear the words that come from your word. Anoint my lips, Lord. The words come forth. May we bring glory to you. We thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. So here we are in Judges chapter 6, and last Sunday we saw how God uses unexpected people to do extraordinary things. People that we may not think in our own understanding or limited understanding, even if we are believers in Jesus Christ and we know Jesus, we still do not know with precision who the people that God would use. In fact, the people that God did use last time we talked about were not the people that the well-to-do, the, the religious, those who know the word would expect. A woman, we talked about. That's very unusual for God to use Deborah, Jael, and um, Shamgar. Those are some people that were unusual for God to use, and yet God is not going to be put in a box. He can do and use anyone he chooses. Today we're going to see how God uses another unlikely person for his great purposes. Now after Deborah and Barak destroyed the Canaanite army, we read in Judges chapter 5, verse 31, the last verse in Judges chapter 5. If you have a Bible, please turn there. It says, So may all your enemies perish, O Lord, but your friends be like the sun as he rises in his might. And the, hand, the land had rest for 40 years. The key uh, part of that verse I want to look at is, but your friends be like the sun as he rises in his mouth. See, there was a great victory that caused Israel to break out in song, in gratitude in Judges 5. And that is the end of that song, verse 31. And it resulted in a long period of peace, 40 years in fact. 40 years, as it says, and the land had rest for 40 years, chapter 5 ends. Now, during which these friends of God, God's friends, says, but, your, but your friends, God, be like the sun as he rises in his might. During the 40 years of peace, God's friends were like the sun as he rises in his might. But after those four decades of peace, God's people again went back to their former ways. Verse 1. Look at chapter 6 again. Verse 1. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian. 
seven years. And so Israel was once again lured away by the idols of this world. In their case, it was the idols of Baal and the pagan worshippers. In our day, our, the idols are different things. You know, but the idols are still luring us away every day of our lives by the world. The idols of this world were just after, in this case, four decades, able to lure them away. And once again, God let them be plundered by their enemies. And you would think, you know, why don't they learn? Why don't they learn? You're going to be saying that over and over again throughout the book of Judges because it's a pattern here. God's people will have a time of peace where they are faithful to Him, and then God's people will, again, do evil in His sight, worshiping idols again, worshiping false gods, and turn away. You're going to wonder, well, how could they do that? Gee, I would never do that. You think so? You think you're better than the people who are just as sinners like we are and will continue to sin? We are the same. We are in the same boat as the pe God's people. We are God's people. And yet we, over and over again, are unfaithful to Him when we are lured away by the idols of this world. And I'll, we'll explain more of that as we go on. Verse 2 of John, Judges chapter 6, verse 2. And the hand of Midian overpowered Israel. And because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves the dens that are in the mountains and in the caves and in the strongholds. For whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. They would encamp against them and devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel and no sheep or ox or donkey, for they would come up with their livestock and their tents. They would come like locusts in number. Both they and their camels could not be counted, so that they can that they waste the land as they came in. So Israel had to hide, it says, in dens and in caves from the Midianites. As you see, the land of Midian was overpowered Israel, and because of the Midian, the people of Israel made themselves the dens that are in the mountains and the caves. So they hid themselves now in caves from the Midianites because out of fear that the Midianites would continue to steal their crops and their livestock and as they lay waste in their land. And so that was the situation it was in the time of Judges just before Gideon uh, was called. Okay, people were hiding in caves. Okay, they, were, they were afraid of the Midianites who continued to plunder their livestock, plunder their crops. And this happened, it says, whenever the Israelites planted crops, and so, um, as it says in verse 3, For whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites, the Amalekites, the people of the East would come up against them. And this happened for them during the seven years, over and over again. Whenever they had crops or food, they thought it was free for the taking. So the Midianites would take, just take it as they pleased. And this happened for seven years. Imagine that. And so during those seven years, as the Midianites plundered their land, the people, it says, cried out for help to the Lord. It says, in the end of verse 7, and the people of Israel cried out for help to the Lord. Seven years of this. And instead of immediately raising up a deliverer, as God may have done in the past, in, in the book of Judges, what we see is that God did something different. This time. Instead, what God did was rebuke his people. He rebuked his people. Look at verse 7. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord on account of the Midianites. The Lord sent a prophet to the people of Israel. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I led you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of slavery. And I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all the who oppressed you and drove them out before you, and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. What's important to see here is that God is not rebuking the non-believers. God is not rebuking the people that are not his people. He's rebuking his people. His people he's calling out. 
God is talking to us the same way. He doesn't just rebuke, oh, those, those sinners out there who are not believers and all that. No, when you see God rebuking people, most of the time he's rebuking his own people. Us. We, his people. We are the ones that need to receive and hear his word because it's directed at us. Not those sinners out there, the sinners in here. And so we need to understand that God had delivered his people, in his case, out of slavery. God has saved us through Jesus Christ by his shed blood. That's true. And he gave them, his people in Israel, the land of Canaan, which should have led to their continual devotion to God. But instead, it says, they did not obey his voice. And they worshipped false gods. Now, we may shake our heads at the unfaithfulness of the Israelites and say, wonder, well, how could they do such a thing? After all that God did for them, how could they do such a thing? We may wonder, you know, if, if, if I was an Israelite, I would never be unfaithful. But are you a human? Are you a sinner saved only by grace? And if you are, you are just as susceptible as any other Israel, any other of God's people, to do the same. And even today, we can be lured away by our own idols and by false gods. Now, what are the false gods that we could be lured away by even today? For example, one of them, I believe, the idols of today, especially in our country, is what I call the, quote, American way of life. That can be an idol. The American way of life, who, where everything is influenced by our own American independent way of thinking. It may have been something that we were told even in comic books, right? Where Superman fights for what? Truth, justice, and what? The American way. We were told from a young age that the American way is the right way. Is that what the scripture says? It doesn't always align with scripture, the American way where we are told the importance in Scripture of justice, mercy, and surrendering ourselves to Jesus. That's what the Scripture says. Justice, mercy, surrender to Jesus Christ. Our allegiance, another is an idol, is to human leaders. Whether these leaders are Christian leaders or not, our allegiance to Christian leaders over and above the scripture can be an idol. Our allegiance to human teachers, our allegiance to political parties must never supersede our allegiance to Jesus Christ. That's whose people we are. That's the one who bought us with a price. No political party died for you. No government, no teacher, no Christian leader, however godly they are, did not give their life for you and die for your sins. Only Jesus did that. And that's to whom you give your ultimate allegiance. See, we tend to be a hero-worshipping society. But God is saying, I am all you need. That's what God is saying. Jesus is saying, I gave my life for you. I am all you need. No one else has done what I have done for you, is what Jesus said. And so therefore, we stand with Jesus Christ. Amen? We stand with Jesus Christ, who, John chapter 2, verse four, uh, 24 says, but Jesus on his part, now listen to this, Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people. Think about that for a minute. What does Jesus say when all people were trying to usher him? Oh, Jesus, we love you, we follow you, we're going to follow you to the end of the And that's after he did a miracle for them. It says, but Jesus on his part, verse John 12, 2, verse 24, but Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people. He knows us. How fickle we are. How prone to idol worship we are, just like the Israelites are. We're no better than them. And it says, he needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. You see that? Jesus did not need anyone to bear witness about him. 
For he himself knew what was in him. He knows our nature. He knows that no matter how Christian we sound, how godly we are, how much we follow, we say we follow him, I say I follow him, he knows that we falter. He knows that I'm prone to wander. He knows that I'm prone to be a hero worshiper, worshiping other things other than him. And that's where we fall. And that's where the Israelites fell. They got so comfortable in the 40 years of rest that they say, oh God, he's on our side. We're on his team. Nothing can happen to us. And so they kind of just let themselves go. And after 40 years, they again, once again, over and over, started worshiping other things. Very subtly. It wasn't like one day they woke up and said, you know what, I'm going to start worshiping idols today. No, it happened over time. It happened subtly, and that's what happens in our lives. And so our first point in your outline this morning is that no matter how much the Lord blesses you, no matter how much the Lord blesses us, we are still prone to worship other things. Remember that whether it's the American way of life or whether it's other Christian leaders or non-Christian leaders or political parties or whatever it may be, we are prone to wander. And don't ever think you yourself being exempt from the same sin that fell to the Israelites and Judges. This is a very appropriate book for us to be looking through during this time. Judges is real to you and I just as it was to Israel. Don't forget that. It also applies to myself, my own we are prone to worship other things. And, and notice how I begin that. No matter how much the Lord blesses us, you might think, well, that's the time where we will be more likely to follow Jesus because he's blessing us. No. Whether he blesses you or whether you are going through troubled times, we are still prone to worship other things. And that's what we remember. That's what happened to Israel. They were being blessed for 40 years and they still turned away and did evil, it says, in the eyes of the Lord. How could that be? Well, search your own heart. The answer is right in our own hearts. We are prone to wander. Now, after rebuking his people, God began the process of raising another judge after he rebuked the people. Verse 11. Now, the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth at Orpah, which belonged to Joash, the Abiezrite while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of God. Now because Israel, the whole nation, was so afraid of having their crops stolen like once again by the Midianites, because they did that every year during the crop harvest, because they were so afraid of having their crops stolen, they had to thresh their grain out of public view so that they wouldn't get stolen. And so that's what Gideon was doing. Ironically, while Gideon, it says, was threshing his wheat in a wine press, which was like a pit out of public view, under a tree, it says. While Gideon was threshing the wheat, hiding himself in a wine press in order to, quote, hide it from the Midianites. It actually says that. In order to hide it from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord says to Gideon, the Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. While he's hiding, so afraid of being caught by the Midianites, he's hiding under a terebinth tree in a wine press to thresh his grain. That's not the normal place where you would thresh wheat. You do it on an open area where the wind would blow the wheat from the chaff. You don't do it in a wine press, which is like a pit. But he did that to hide. And that's what, Jesus, uh, that's what the Lord said to him when he saw him. The Lord, the angel of the Lord says, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. What valor? Valor means courage. What courage did Gideon show at that moment? What courage could you see in a man hiding in a wine press in the bottom of a pit so he could hide the little wheat he had? What valor did he really have? And so Gideon himself seemed confused by his statement. O mighty man of valor, the Lord is with you. Verse 13, the, and Gideon said to him, Please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? 
And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. How can you say that the Lord is with us, Gideon is basically asking. How can you say the Lord is with us if we are constantly being plundered by the Midianites over and over again? How can you say that the Lord is with us? We're being plundered. We might ask the same question. How can we say the Lord is with us when our country is burning before our very eyes? You turn on the TV and you see looting and burning and fires. And people are, are you know, shuttered in because of the pandemic and all these things are happening. How can you say the Lord is with us during this time when the Midianites steal our crops every year? This is what Gideon's question. That's a good question. And you know what the answer is? Because the Lord disciplines those he loves. And that's how you know the Lord's with you. Because of the very things you're going through. The Lord disciplines those he loves. If he didn't care about these people, he would just ignore them and let them be annihilated by the Midianites. But the fact that the Lord loves them is why he allows them to be disciplined in his love. See, throughout the book of Judges, in Judges chapter 2, for example, verse 11, it says, And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals, and they abandoned the Lord and the God of the fathers who had brought them out of the land of Egypt, and they went after other gods and from among the gods of the peoples who were around them and bowed down to them, and they provoked the Lord to anger. And he gave them over to plunderers who plundered them. <coughs> and then it says, so God, in, as a result of, of being uh, angry about their, their sinning, their unfaithfulness, so God says in Judges chapter 2, verse 20, because this people, now listen to this carefully, because this people have transgressed my covenant that I commanded their fathers and have not obeyed my voice, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations that Joshua left when he died in order to test Israel by them. In order to test Israel by them. Whether they will take care to walk in the way of the Lord as their fathers did or not. Testing is what God was doing. Testing was a way of refining his people through adversity. That's what you do when you refine metals. You put a lot of heat on the metal to purify it of all its impurities, to burn off all the impurities in metals. And that's what God was doing through discipline. He was testing them as a way of refining his people through their adversity. That's how you know God loved them. That's how you know God loved wisdom because the very fact they're going through discipline. And so God, in his mercy, instead of completely destroying his people, he disciplined them in his love in order to bring them back to him. But like most people, Gideon did not understand this. Didn't understand that at all. He assumed, like many people do, that suffering meant God had forsaken them. Suffering meant God had forsaken them. Isn't that what we think? When you're going through tough times, you wonder, where's God? Has he forsaken me? Verse uh, 13 again. We're all the wonderful deeds, but now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the land of Midian. That's what Gideon thought. He didn't see it as a sign of God's presence at all. The Lord is with you? Huh, it doesn't seem that way. It seems like he's forsaken us when the opposite is true. No, God is disciplining you here in His love. He's always with you. But as most people believe, Gideon believed that God had forsaken him. Verse 14. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hands of Midian. Do I not send you? And Gideon said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? 
Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. So, as Gideon was calling God out, saying, what do you mean you're with us? The Lord is with you. No, you got, you've forsaken us. Look at seven years of this. We've been having to hide our crops, and we've been forsaken, and we have to t give up our crops to the Midianites, and they steal it from us every year, yet year after year for seven years. And so, God calls Gideon out on that assumption that God has forsaken him. He calls him out, basically saying, So, Gideon, you say that I have abandoned you? Okay, I now send you to save Israel. Now go out and do it. You say I have forsaken you, so I now I call you. Go out and save Israel. And then Gideon quickly changes his tune. Oh, please, my clan is so weak. And I'm the least in my family. How could I save Israel? You just said, I forsake you. Know, I'm going to send you now. Save me. No, but I'm so weak. And oh, I can't do that. Oh. You see how people are? See how we are? See, when God asks you to obey him, we're, we're not ready to obey him. See, we, we have all these excuses. Oh, I can't do that. I'm too weak. I, God can't use me in that way. He just called him out on his own blood. You say I forsaken you. I send you now to save Israel. Go do it. And he gives a bunch of excuses. So such is human nature. How can I save Israel? Verse 16. And the Lord said to him, But I will be with you. But I will be with you. And you shall strike the Midianites as one man. And he said to him, If now I have found favor in your eyes, then show me a sign. Sure. And so God clearly told him, Go out and save Israel. But he also told him, I will be with you. Okay, I'm going to be doing it through you. Oh, my presence is with you just like it always has been. I'm going to send you and I will be with you. Basically that means, I'm all you need. Like I said in the last point, Jesus is all we need. We don't need heroes in this world. We don't need idols. We don't need any teacher. We, we need Jesus. I am all you need, Jesus says. And that's what God is saying to Gideon. I will be with you. That's all you need. Is it enough for you that I'm with you? I am all you need. But Gideon still was not convinced. So he asks for a sign that the Lord really is the Lord. And so Gideon prepares an offering for him. Verse 19. So Gideon went into his house and prepared a young goat and unleavened cakes from an ephah of flour and the meat he put in a basket and the broth he put in a pot and brought them to him under the terebinth and presented them. And the angels of God said to him, take the meat and the eleven cakes and put them on this rock. And pour out the broth over them. And he did so. And then the angel of the Lord reached out the tip of his staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened cakes. And fire sprang up from the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened cakes. And the angel of the Lord vanished from sight. And then Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. That's when he's getting to realize he's in trouble. That this is really the Lord. I mean, with, a, with just a touch of a staff, no torch. <coughs> Excuse me. The fire burned the altar. And then the Lord just vanishes from the side. <coughs> so Gideon, right then and there, becomes fully convinced that this is the Lord he's talking to. But now he's afraid again. But now he's afraid of something else. He's afraid now that he knows it's the Lord because he believes that no one can stand before God face to face and live. Verse 22. Then the angel of the, the Gideon perceived that the, he was the angel of the Lord. And Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace be to you. Do not fear. You shall not die. See, that's what Gideon was afraid of. 
that he was going to die because he just saw God go away to the Lord face to face. That's what he believed. And then Gideon built an altar, verse 24, there to the Lord and called it, The Lord is Peace. To this day, it stands at Ophrah, which belongs to the Abiathites. And so the Lord assures Gideon that he would not die. And now that Gideon has full confidence that God is with him, as he's just proven, the Lord now has an important task for Gideon. Verse 25. That night the Lord said to him, Take your father's bull and the second bull, seven years old, and pull down the altar of Baal that your father has and cut down the Asherah that is beside. And Asherah is an idol worshiping uh, pole that people used to worship, pagan gods. His father has it. He says, Tear that down. Pull down the altar of Baal that your father has and cut down the Asherah that is beside it. Verse 26, And build an altar to the Lord God on top of the stronghold here with stones laid in due order. And then take the second bull and offer it as a burnt offering with the wood of the Asherah that you shall cut down. And so in order for God to deliver his people, he wanted them to first get rid of their false idols. Fair enough. You're going to follow me now? Follow me. Get rid of your false idols. Tear down that altar to Baal that you have. Your father himself built that for you, for, for Baal. The altar of Baal that belonged to Gideon's own father. Tear that down. Burn a bull on it. Up to the Lord. Now Gideon's commitment to God at this point put him at odds with his own family, with his own father, and with his own community. And so how would Gideon respond to that? I mean, if he goes there, it's his own father's idol to Baal. The, the people of, of, of Israel were worshiping the Baals, at least in, in the area of Gideon, the Manasseh. How would Gideon respond? Verse 27. So Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord told him. But because he was too afraid of his family and the men of the town to do it by day, he did it by night. At least he did it. So he did what God told him to do because he did fear God, but because he feared man, he did it at night. Fair enough. I mean, he did it. And there still was going to be an aftermath. So he did what God told him to do because he did fear God more than he feared man, even though he still had some fear of man, as indicated him by him doing it at night. Now, when we ourselves go through tough times, do we also, like Gideon, assume that God has forsaken us? Or do we recognize that God sometimes allows certain hardships into our lives because of the very fact that he loves us. See what I'm saying? Do we assume when we go through tough times that God has forsaken us like Gideon did? Or do we recognize that God sometimes allows hardship into our lives because he loves us so much? He loves us so much and he loves us too much to just leave us in our sinful ways. He loves us too much to just leave us in our pride. He loves us too much to just leave us in our indifference to Him. He loves us too much to leave us in our unfaithfulness to Him. He loves you too much, so that's why He disciplines you. What does any parent do when their child is going astray? Does he not or she not discipline their child? Not because they hate their child, but because He loves them? God does no difference. It's because He loves you that sometimes He disciplines us in His and lets you go through some hardship because he loves you too much to leave you in your sin. He loves you too much to leave you in your pridefulness. He loves you too much to leave you in your unfaithfulness and in your wandering, your indifference. Gideon thought too little of himself to believe that God could use him. But God told him 
I will be with you. I am all you need. Do we discount what God can do through us because we doubt God's power? Or do we doubt that, or discount what God can do through us because we look at our own needs and our own limitations and say, well, God can't use that. See, that's not saying anything about yourself. That's saying something about God when you say that God can't use you. When God can't use me because I don't have X, Y, Z. I don't have this training. I don't have this experience. I don't have whatever. I don't have faith. I don't have courage. Do we discount what God can do through us because we doubt His power to do whatever He chooses through whomever He chooses? See, Gideon was not an example of faith, as you're starting to see already. Gideon was not the first choice of a, of a faithful, mighty warrior, even though that's what he called them at the beginning, right? Men of valor, mighty man of valor. Where do you see that in, this ver in these verses? Does he look like a mighty man of valor to you? So as soon as God called him, he says, don't use me, I'm, I'm the weakest in my clan, and, and I, we're the weak, and I can't do that. He's hiding in the wine press. Show me a sign. No, God can use whoever he chooses. It's because it's about him, it's not about us. Gideon had fear, as we all do. But he overcame that fear when he trusted him. So our second point is that God can use us not because we are fearless. God does not use you because you're fearless and never falter. Gideon faltered. He had fear, clearly. But God can use us because we overcome fear through faith. It's not that he didn't have fear. He did have fear. But he overcame that fear eventually. Now, after Gideon tore down the altar of Baal, things got very heated now. Because remember, that was his father's altar to Baal. The people of Israel were worshiping Baal at the time. They were idol worshipers. Things got very heated in verse 28. Then the men of the town rose early in the morning, and behold, the altar of Baal was broken down. And the Asherah beside it was cut down. And the second bowl was offered on the altar that had been built. And they said to one another, Who has done this thing? And after they had searched and inquired, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, has done this thing. And the men of the town said to Joash, Bring out your son that he may die. For he has broken down the altar of Baal and cut down the Asherah beside it. Now you know what's really ironic about what we just read. Think about it. You know what's really ironic about what we just, what was, what was that? And what was really sad about that? That the people of Israel, mind you, it's the people of Israel who were so upset that someone had broken down a pagan altar to Baal. They're so upset about that, they want to kill Gideon over that. They want to get him executed for tearing down a pagan altar altar to Baal. Now remember, God's laws had stated that people were to be stoned for committing idolatry in Israel. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 13. This is what God's law says. If your brother, the son of your mother, or the son of your daughter, or the wife you embrace, even if it's your own wife, or your friend who's at her as is as your own soul entices you secretly, saying, Let's go and serve other gods, you shall not yield to him or listen to him. You shall stone him to death with stones, because he sought to draw you away from the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. That's what you were supposed to do to idol worshippers. That's what you were supposed to do to Baal worshippers. Stone them, execute them. And here the sad irony is. Gideon got rid of the idol worship to Baal, and they want to kill him. That's how far gone Israel has gone. God's law stated that people were to be stoned for committing idolatry. It shows you how com completely sold over to idolatry they were. They wanted Baal, and they wanted Gideon executed for tearing down the altar of Baal. When God's law says, 
the opposite. No, if you worship Baal, you're supposed to be stoned. And so the people wanted Gideon's father to hand over his son for destroying his father's altar to Baal. It's his father's altar. Verse 31. But Joash said, that's Gideon's father, Joash said to all who stood against him, Will you contend for Baal? Or will you save him? Whoever contends for him shall be put to death by morning. If he is a god, let him contend for himself, because his altar has been broken down. Therefore, on that day, Gideon was called Jerub Baal. That is to say, let Baal contend against him, because he broke down his altar. So Joash, Gideon's father, was apparently a well-respected man in his community. He was not only well respected, but he was apparently the leader of Baal worship in his committee, in his community. Because remember, that's his altar that he built. Gideon's father built that, that altar to Baal. It's his own altar. So he was a leader of Baal worship in that community. And he basically was saying here, I built this altar, and it was my bowl that was sacrificed. If Baal truly is a god, let Baal be with Gideon. So Gideon was called Jeru Baal, which means let Baal contend. As a reminder that they would see how Baal would deal with Gideon. And of course, Baal did not do a thing, because Baal did not exist. Baal was a farce. Baal did nothing, because Baal didn't even exist. And so this was further confirmation to Gideon. God was with him. He did what he, God told him to do, even though he was so afraid he did it at night. And his life was going to be executed. He was almost killed for it. But God protected him. God was with him and protected him. And so after that second time, God showed his faithfulness to him, his presence to him. First he showed it to him in that, that offering that he burned up and then he disappeared. Second time he showed his faithfulness to him by protecting his life. He says, do what I say. Burn that altar to Baal. And everybody wanted his life. And God protected him. Now a greater threat arose in Israel. And that's in verse 33. The greater threat rises on the horizon. Verse 33. Now all the Midianites and the people and the Malachites and the people of the east came together. And they crossed the Jordan and encamped in the valley of Jezreel. And so, the Midianites and their allies, the Malachites, the people of the East, amassed their armies for a, yet another raid upon Israel to once again plunder their crops and their livestock yet again. But this time, God did something different. Verse 34. But the spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon, and he sounded the trumpet, and the Abiezrites were called out to follow him, and he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, and they too were called out to follow him, and he sent messengers to Asher and to Zebulun and Naphtali, and they went up to meet them. God is doing something different here. He sent the spirit of the Lord to come upon Gideon in such a way that he was inspired by God to rally the troops of Israel. And the people responded. And they had 32,000 soldiers amassed. Which seems like a lot, but it wasn't a lot compared to the army they were against. 32,000 soldiers. So first, God assured Gideon of his presence. Back in verse 12. When the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of God. First, God's presence with him was with Gideon. Then God commissioned him to lead his people. Verse 14. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do I not send you? So God was with him, and then God commissioned him to a certain task, to save Israel. And then, now, 
God empowered him to take action. Verse 34. But the Spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon, and he sounded the trumpet. So God gave him his presence, God commissioned him, and God empowered him to take action. What more would he need? The troops were now ready for battle. Everyone was ready for battle. 32,000 soldiers. Everyone was ready. Except for Gideon. Because at that crucial moment, just before the battle, he wavered once again. And you're going to think, are you kidding? No, verse 36. Then Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, behold, I am laying a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece alone and it is dry on all the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. Notice how he starts his statement. If you will save Israel. What do you mean, if? He already was present with you. He showed himself at that altar he burned and disappeared. Then he commissioned you, and then the Holy Spirit came upon him, it says. Now an army has arisen, and they're right behind you, 32,000 strong. What do you mean, if, at this moment? If you will save Israel, I'm going to put out this little lamb's wool, and, you know, if you put water on the dew, on that lamb's wool, need the other dry, then I'll believe that you're with me. Why did Gideon have doubts now? Why is he doubting? Because no matter how he appeared on the outside, he had fear and a lack of assurance on the inside, as many of us do. Oh, yeah, we may say that we're strong and we're faithful, but you know what? God knows your breaking point. And when he puts you at that breaking point, as I've been there myself, maybe you've been there, I'm sure many of you have, you start to have little doubts in your mind. Is God with us or not? So I don't really blame Gideon. But at the same time, it seems kind of strange at this very moment, after all he's done for him and assured him and told him over and over again, Gideon once again lacks assurance and has fear. A vast army has already entered Israel. Remember, verse 33. Now all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of Israel of these of these came Israel came together and they crossed the Jordan and encamped in the valley of Jericho. They were already invaded Israel. They already amassed an army against him, 120,000 strong. They were inside their land. And for seven years, the people had been hiding in caves, remember, in fear of these people. Verse 2, And the hand of Midian overpowered Israel because of Midian, the power of Israel, made for themselves the dens that are in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. Why were they hiding in caves and, and in dens? Because they were so afraid for seven years. And whenever the Midianites came, they came with their swift camels like a horde of locusts and took whatever they wanted. Verse 3 again. For whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites and the Malachites and the people of the east would come up against them and they would encamp against them and devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel and no sheep or ox or donkey. They would come up with their livestock in their tents and they would come like locusts in number. Both they and their camels could not be counted so that they laid waste the land as they came. This is what they were up against. An army that had laid waste to their land and did as they pleased, plundering their land over and over again for seven years. And now they're in their land, this very moment, 120,000 strong. You can see why Gideon was a little afraid there. Gideon's army was only a bunch of untrained foot soldiers. How would this time be any different? So Gideon asked God for a sign, as proof that he would save Israel. He says, I'm going to put out this fleece, this lamb's wool. 
if there's dew on the fleece when the land is dry around it, then, I'll, then I know, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. And so in verse 37, God responded. Verse 37. Behold, I am the young fleece, and there's dew in the land, and through the fleece, I shall know that you will save Israel. And verse 38 says, And it was so. When he rose early the next morning and squeezed the fleece, he wrung enough dew from the fleece to fill a bowl of water. Now, although Gideon's fear might be understandable, it was also insulting to God when you think about it. It's not mince words. What Gideon did was an insult to God's faithfulness. It was an insult to God's character. It's insulting to God after all that he had already done for him. Did not the angel of the Lord already appear to Gideon and burn up his offering and then disappear in verse 21? Did not God already protect him from harm when he asked him to tear down his father's altar and then they wanted to kill him and yet he was spared? But God in his grace still did what Gideon wanted in verse 38. And it was so, verse 38, and he arose the next morning and squeezed the fleece and rubbed enough dew from the fleece to fill the bowl of water. God responded, though he was insulted by his lack of faith. But even after that first sign, Gideon still, what? Had his doubts, believe it or not. Perhaps it was just a coincidence. You know, the, the fleece, you know, that's kind of absorbent, maybe. I don't think wool is that absorbent. But maybe he thought to his mind, well, the wool had, one, you know, but the, the land was dry. But yeah, but maybe, you know, the land dry. Maybe it was just a coincidence. So verse 39, he said, But Gideon said to God, Well, let not your anger burn against me. Let me speak just once more. Please let me test just once more with the fleece. Please let it be dry on the fleece only, and on all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night. And it was dry on the fleece only, and on all the ground there was no dew. What God did is not how we are to seek guidance. Okay, just put that out there. That is not the way we are to seek guidance. It says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. That's true. So what God did, what Gideon did, was not how we seek guidance from God, because in Gideon's case, he was not seeking guidance like, should I do this or should I do that? That's not what he was doing. Read closely what he was asking. Gideon already knew what God wanted him to do. Go against the Midianites and save Israel. So it wasn't a matter of, do I do, what, what do you want me to do? He knew what, he wanted, what God wanted him to do. What Gideon did was about not knowing what to do. It was about his own fear in doing what God wanted him to do. That's what Gideon's fleece was about. See, the safest place to be, the safest place for him to be, is in the center of God's will for your life. No matter what the world may seem like, or no matter what situations you find yourself, whatever fears you have, the safest place you will always be is in the center of God's will for your life. Do His will. And then we give all the fear we have to Him. Because you will have fear. There's no point in denying our fear. That's not going to help. I'm not afraid, I'm not afraid, I'm not afraid. He didn't have fear. And God still used him. That's the amazing thing about this whole story. Gideon is a fearful man. We're going to see next chapter even more of his fears. But the safest place to be is always in the center of God's work in your life. Even when God blesses us, we are still prone to forsake Him. God uses those who overcome their fear through faith. And nowhere is safer than to be doing God's will. 
He will give you grace. Father, we thank you that you have allowed us this time to look at Gideon's life. There are a lot of things going on in our world that may cause us to fear. In our own lives, there's so much unrest in our world. There's so much things to fear. Rumors that we hear. What's the government going to do? What's what people going to do to me? What is man going to do to me? Oh no, is what we fear. And that is natural, Lord. That is understandable. But Father, let us not give in to fear. Let us trust you, Lord. And give our fear.